Steve Seymour here with the Investors Agent Podcast. Uh, today we have Scott Zukin. Scott, thanks for being on today. Pleasure being here. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, appreciate it. Uh, Scott now is not just an acquaintance, but I consider a dear friend, a uh, great business owner and real estate investor. Um, so <clears throat> Scott, I want to have you tell people a little bit about your background and how you fell into real estate as a second generation real estate business owner, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, we could start way back. Well, I was, uh, I, I, I see the beginning really as, uh, where I was trained in a family business. My father was a pharmacist, uh, 10 years old. I was selling cigarettes, standing on a milk crate, <laughs> learned how to give change to people. You know I mean? At this point you couldn't do that now, but uh, there were no restrictions on it. Um, and, and I remember people being pissed off when cigarettes went up to 55 cents. Oh pack. man. So it was a while ago. Um, but, but in before working, the pandemic, I guess right, way before, <laughs> way before, um, the, you know, the, learning to work in a family business created such a great work ethic for, for all of us. And, it, and I'm great to say that my, you know, happy to say my, um, my brother my sister and I are all entrepreneurs. And I think we developed that from, from learning to work hard and work together. And that, I think that's really a lot of the beginning. So I found an interest uh, in cabinet making, became a cabinet maker. Um, before I went to uh, college, my parents and made me go to college and I was like, okay, I'm going to go to Philadelphia College of Art. They have a cabinet making program, opened up my own business and loved what I did, but did not do well as a businessman. Um, and I was only as good as my hand. So it was not a scalable thing. And I struggled through that through many years. Um, while I watched the real estate business grow in Westchester and my father had his, he, he sold his business to Rite Aid was able to uh, get a great mortgage and then turn that money in that property into buying many, many properties where he was a community member and knew lots of people in the community there. So from that point, he begged me to come work with him. He had, he had the, the, the basic real estate business started, but didn't have a good construction team, didn't have, um, was, he, he was sort of stuck in his, in his ability to grow because of the size of of the people that he had and just saw an amazing vision in Westchester. And again, this is for, for those that know about Westchester, I don't know, is this a local or is this? Yeah, a, there, there could be listeners all over, okay. but most yeah, of our so, listeners are so probably a lot, local. A lot of, a lot of the, the towns, the, a lot of the small towns in uh, mid 1970s failed miserably because, you know, shopping malls opened all that new stuff, big department stores, the mom and pop business really struggled. Same thing happened in Westchester. So the town that was 60% vacant, you know, we had, we had the vision of like, th there's a lot of opportunity here. We had a perfect town. It's a um, county seat. So you have, you have your courthouses there. You have lawyers. You have old money. You have a, a university that's very successful. And um, you have a hospital. So you have doctors, lawyers, students, diversity. That's all you need to build a town. And... Um, through that, we were able to buy properties and slowly fix them up, buy them at, at rates that at, in, in this day seemed crazy cheap, <laughs> but back then, back then it didn't. It, it was like yeah. you, you, we couldn't make the numbers work. But knowing in business, you always pay your bills. But I'm diverting a little bit. But so my dad asked me. I'm going back to the cabinet making. My dad asked me to come back. I finally said to him, "I'll give you one year." And if it doesn't work, we go our own ways. I kind of wasn't thrilled about working for him. It felt like it was a step back because I was doing my own thing and now I'm working for someone. But the concept at that time for me to get paid every job I got was kind of cool because I wasn't getting paid for everything I was doing with the, with the cabinet making. Cabinet making yeah. And I literally worked myself up in the company from swinging a hammer, uh, building a construction team to eventually running, you know, the entire uh, office. So and the entire team. It's pretty amazing. And you guys had the vision for Westchester, you know, such a long time ago. It's such a, it's, it's an amazing town with a lot of charm. And, you know, you, you saw the opportunity to buy at the right time, uh, even though it didn't seem like the right time then, you know, because like you were saying, it was hard to even make the numbers work then, but you, you made it happen. Yeah. Um, 
So fast forward today, do you mind sharing a little bit about what the business entails? I know you guys have a, a lot of rental properties, student housing, uh, commercial, retail, restaurant, you know. It's a, yeah, that's exactly right. And I think that that mix is what, for us in real estate, has made it work, where we have um, a mix of, you know, the stuff, the student housing is very, very strong. We fell into that accidentally. And... Um, we now are about 60% student apartments. Uh, some of them are, are student licensed apartments. Some of them are just students that live in one bedroom apartments on their own. Students have become very wealthy. Um, I want to talk about students for a second. We'll divert there All a little right. bit. So, so the, the borough um, put a restriction on students and the restriction was left open in town center. And that's where most of our properties are. So, all of a sudden, we have all these students living in town center. And we had we, we were some of the first people in Westchester to put granite countertops on our apartments. And our apartments, again, are not, we're not new buildings. We're all, our newest building is, I think, 75 years old. So we're looking at old houses that have been converted into apartments. We're renovating. We're putting granite countertops. We're like, you know, this is going to be a higher-end person. It's not going to be students. And students are paying the, the rent to have the high-end apartments for washers and dryers. I mean, of course, now pretty much every apartment has that kind of thing. Back then, we're like, we're putting this in. We probably won't get students in here. All of a sudden, we have tons of students renting from us. Then the borough changes the restriction to become in town center. So all of a sudden, every existing student apartment that we had at that time is grandfathered in as, as a student apartment. So... Um, all of a sudden, wow, we're in the student business, and it's and it's a it's it's a very uh, profitable business, and it has its up and ups and downs. But you have uh, just the strength of of the university that that keeps that going. So we have student housing, we have um, some high end housing, where you know we have the granite countertops and other really nice things. You know, where we have we're renovating ha historic houses, and we really honor the the building that way you know with 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 what was originally in the building and 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 retain some of the original history of the building with all the modern amenities you know we have some decks outside that's one of the things that keeps westchester so unique is mm -hmm. <clears throat> the history and the architecture yeah absolutely absolutely we're not the type of people that'll go in and knock a building down and start over um it's a much cheaper way to go ahead and do construction we tend to put too much money into a building, but at that point, it cuts back on our maintenance. It cuts back on, on a lot of unknowns. We just we just fix it all the way, the first time. And I think from my background in construction and cabinet making, that's where that craft had helped really craft and and enjoy uh, these buildings. So we we love it. We love doing it. It's sort of like a collection of, of stuff. Yeah, so. and just knowing you on a personal level, mm -hmm. and you're, you know. Um, your enthusiasm for woodworking and architecture and building. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's nice to see someone that actually, you know, obviously you run it as a business, but also look at the housing and the buildings and has, have you have that appreciation for it. And I think a lot of investors don't have that at all, which in turn, I think makes them good investments because people mm -hmm. will come in and maybe pay a little more for that. Yeah, I think so. Sometimes the, the extra money that we're putting in, we don't get any more rent. But we have zero. We run into zero vacancy, like constant demand. Hundreds of apartments, and we have one apartment that's vacant right now. The person died. We have two other apartments we consider vacant. They're under construction. You couldn't move into them, right? And then the other three vacancies we call them. I have people living in them until like sixty days from now. They just didn't rent sixty days earlier. So that's that's our vacancy rate. You know, yeah, it's 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 like not next to nothing. Yeah, yeah. So that, you know, you'd ask, I want to finish answering your question. If I can <laughs> sure, try to stay sure. focused. No, you're good. The, um, so we rent to students. We have high-end apartments. Um, and then we also are very, very dedicated in giving back. So we have some, uh, some low-income housing, I'll call it, or subsidized housing. We help out a lot of vets um, that, that we're, we're homeless. And there's some great programs out there for vets that the government has has helped out to raise money and support, which is really more important 
that, that a lot of people coming from experiencing homelessness, they really need the support and guidance as to how to be a good community member, making sure that they're whatever, if it's a non-smoking apartment or they can't be loud or they, you know, all the things you have to do to be a good neighbor, a lot of these people just don't know. And it comes across to most people as someone being rude. And honestly, they just, they just never had an opportunity to live in a nice environment. So we love that we're able to do that. Um, I'm proud to say that we bought a building that had two vets in it, and they came to us 15-plus years ago, and we're like, I can't believe you bought this building. You guys are jerks. You're going to kick us out. And I was like, no, we're not. We're going to help you to stay in. We're going to have to move you around a little bit, but we're going to find you a place that you can live in. And, again, they've been there for, for 15 years. They've... You know, one of the guys has actually helped take care of my daughter once. So it was kind of, you know, we actually developed a, a deep friendship with, with this person that kind of looked at us as a developer, as a cold person that was going to, you know, just take the community and, and just fix it up um, for high-end stuff. So I think it's important to have diversity in a community. And, that, and that's part of what we, we look at in our residential. Yeah, it's something I admire about you. And, you know, I know a lot of real estate investors, very few even – care to know <laughs> much about their buildings or their tenants or the community. They're, they're, they're just strictly looking at how much money can I make? How much, how much do I have to invest? How much can I make? Right. And that's, that's kind of what happens over time is it loses its luster. And I think for you being in the business so long and being so entrenched in the community and with the business owners, um, it's hard to go out to eat with Scott in Westchester and, <laughs> and not walk into <laughs> somewhere that, people know him because he's their landlord. Right. Yeah. Um, but you're involved and it's really cool to see that where I just think a lot of investors at your scale, at your level of property you own are very like they're, they, they don't even want to deal with the tennis. They don't want to even deal with that. And I know you have people in place, but I know you're still very involved. And I just admire that about you, that you're so community driven. I feel like you're not just a real estate inv investor, but you're, you provide housing, you provide buildings for business owners. You know, like I look at it differently. Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, acknowledging that. Cause that's a big part of, of what we do um, in a way through um, I'll say failing, you know, in cabinet making, I've been able to live vicariously through many, many business owners. So we provide, you know, we, we have uh, what, like about 40 businesses in Westchester and we're providing a place for them to do their business and, and a place for them to make their money. And for me, it's kind of fun to help watch a guy get started, you know, grow into his next space or just really, you know, kill it as a restaurant. So cool to see that, right? And the thing yeah, about how many yeah. jobs that's providing yeah. and how much revenue it's bringing into right. the town. And right. it's, it's a whole ecosystem. It is. It is. And it supports one another. In fact, it's, it's, I'll tell you a little funny story. We always support our tenants. We always go to the restaurants, the, you know, the gift shops, whatever they are. We, we support, you know, some of the attorneys that, that, that we rent to. And, um, so, you know, about a, a year after my dad had died, I took my mom out to lunch in Westchester and she's like, Oh my God, this restaurant's really great. I didn't know we owned this building. <laughs> and I'm like, actually we don't own this building. It was like the first time she was at a non Zukin restaurant for lunch, because she just like always yeah. had to support the tenants, so it was like it was a funny thing. So, yes, yeah, that's that's pretty awesome. Uh, no, I think it's the big thing that I like to always point out is real estate is a people business, and I think you haven't lost touch of that that aspect of it. And I think that's kind of your secret sauce. I I, th I think it is. I think it's a big part of uh, we. You know, we we have an open office concept. I do. Um, have time for people to come in. I, I prefer they make an appointment, but when, you know, when there's an issue that's, that's a pretty big issue, I like to, I'd like to at least know that, you know, sometimes I'll personally follow up with a phone call. Hey, whatever this, this happened, there was a rainstorm, your part of your ceiling fell in. Are you okay? Is everything okay? We took care of you. Okay. It kind of sucked, but you know, yep. it's an old building and you know, those types of things do, uh, do happen, but I, I'm also there along with my team to make sure it's okay. Cool. So we talked a little bit about your past, kind of present, and then future. And I know you. I, I kind of want to touch on uh, your new development that you have going down 
downtown Westchester with your new hotel that you guys are putting up. And yeah. I, yeah. Do you mind sharing a little bit about that? Sure. So we are in the process. It was actually a 15 year process. So, you know, there's a <laughs> lot of, a lot of, we, we, we bought a lot of architects cars, I think, and through this process, it was, a, there was a, a lot of, uh, a lot of things. 15 that year on. entitlement process. Yes. yes. So it began, um, with a project that was that was going to be a uh, a private and public project where the parking garage in Westchester needed to get rebuilt, so they had an idea they were going to put a hotel and a parking garage together, and there was a request for a proposal and ideas, and we had the adjoining property that was the old pharmacy, so it all goes back to the uh, the family business at the drugstore, and. We were able. We we presented a hundred and twenty foot building with condos, uh, lead cert, lead certified gold. You know the highest end of of, of environmental. Um, it was about two hundred rooms, a banquet space. I believe it was a hundred condos and a parking garage, all combined into one space. And it was too much. It was too much for the borough to wrap their heads around. Um, and at this point we have a six story, 108 room hotel, which I'm not, I, I'm not defeated by that, but it's, it's a project that we were able to do because there got to be a point where it was like, okay, it's enough. Let's just get this project done. Cause there's a, lo all, a whole lot of other opportunity that we're, we're tying up by, by continuing to fight the fight. Right. So we, we consented to a lot of things because of that 120 foot hotel. Uh, presentation, they lowered the feet, the the the, the, um, the the building height in Westchester to 90 feet, and it was all you know from us trying to build a building that by right we could have done actually to 180 feet at that time. So we just continued to work with the borough again as a community member. Not 100 percent sure if that was the correct thing to do because some some builders go in and say this is what I can do by right, so either you let me do this or you know, or let me do this. And that's their negotiation. We tend to, again, we tend to try to work with the community. And I, and I think at the end, the project's going to be really exciting. So again, it's a 108 room hotel Indigo. Um, we have a restaurant on the first floor that does have some banquet space. And uh, are you inclined? Are you able to share what restaurants going in there, or is that um, not not? I, out no, there I can't. No, I can. Okay. I can tell you that. Or it's, what it's, kind of restaurant? Well, it's, I, it's, I live a, nearby, and I'm like yeah, yeah, waiting for yeah. some good restaurants. It's, to come it's in. a fish restaurant, which we do need in Westchester. We definitely need some seafood. Um, and it's and it's. I mean, it's the guy who who owns uh, Big Fish, um, which you know in the Delaware okay. beaches and yeah. all that. So he has many many concepts. So we're not. Um, we're not exactly decided on what concept, but it is going to be a very high end fish restaurant. So that's, I'll be eating there. Yes, you will. So I will too. Get it, get it done sooner than later. Yeah, I'm hungry. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It's so cool. You know, it's, uh, it's amazing to, you know, be, uh, talking to someone who's building a hundred and hundred plus room hotel and you're just, it's just a casual conversation, right? I mean, I mean, I know that's been 15 years in the making, but it's amazing to think about that kind of scale, right? Not too many people are involved in that type of project. Um, so thank you for being so humble and sharing, you know, what's out there. The intention of this podcast that I've set is really to help transform the human mindset from scarcity and lack to abundance and wealth, specifically by having a conversation about real estate as real estate being one possible vehicle to create wealth. <clears throat> and with your 20 plus, is it 20 plus 30, 30 years? Almost, uh, it's probably getting close to 30, almost yeah. 30 years in, in real estate investing. Uh, what would you say are some of the biggest challenges that you've had to overcome? Because anything that people can learn from your mistakes, they don't have to repeat. So actually I learned a little bit from you, Steve, just, just in watching your development, because in my head, I'm like, Oh my God, that property should be a hundred thousand dollars. And in your mind, wow, that's worth a million dollars because you're coming in like at a new place and I'm coming in from the old place. And you, you kind of have to keep aware of that, that risk and struggle and, and ability to just work it. Cause you know, I, I really believe that when you work something, 
um, it'll it'll work out. It's somehow it you know you just well have think to about your what you guys did with Westchester, right? Yeah. Like that town, yeah. you know. And I'm not saying you're the only single influence mm-hmm. on it, right? There was mm-hmm. other factors, but you guys had a huge influence on the you know and investing down there, right? So it's absolutely uh, you had you have to have some level of faith and trust that you're 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 making an investment in something that's going to turn out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you do you know you you make that investment. You probably pay, you know, you know, there's a little bit of buyer's remorse sometimes when you're buying things because um, you don't know. And you just really have to believe in your vision of what you're going to do. You know, I'm going to make this successful. You're going to fall into humps and, they, and they're scary. Yeah. You just have to realize that, you know, and time fixes a lot of stuff, especially in real estate. You know, there, there, was a, there was a statement that we always use that you can't pay too much for real estate. You just buy too early. Just buy too early. Yeah. Yeah, so if you, if you look back and say 20 years ago, if you, out of all the properties you bought 20 years ago and have kept for 20 years, have any of them been losers? No, <laughs> no. And the, th- and the ones that I feel that I've lost on are the ones that we didn't buy. Yeah. And honestly, there, there are times right now where I kick myself in the rear end and I'm like, I can't believe I talked my dad out of buying that. I can't believe we didn't buy this. I can't believe we didn't figure out how to get the little bit of money to throw together to make this work because now it would have been, it would have been like almost nothing for us to run because we have that team in place. And that's the other thing I want to talk about is that in building your, your company, you really, you really need the team to depend on. And that takes as much time as fixing a building. And there's, there's a lot. And I think part of, part of what I do, um, with with my team is I think part of what we do is is flexibility and celebrating what we create. So those are two things like when when you're hired by me, um, you'll know that you can have some flexibility. I have a lot of single parents that work for me. And, you know, my my assistant is like, oh, I got to leave my my son needs me at school. I'm like, okay, well, we'll just talk tonight and get that little project done. You know, there are things that have to get done. We can't be yeah. too flexible. But, right. but that allows people to live, you have to live life and not just work all the time. I think that that's what I'm trying to communicate, that it, it may not be, the, you know, the same way that I do it, but I think that in, in building your team, you have to figure out how to have that balance in life. That's awesome. What, uh, what are some of the things that you've had to overcome in terms of just mindset with, with growth, because I find that a lot of people, I mean, I've said this a million times on this podcast. If you listen to me, it sounds like the same thing over and over, but it's where a lot of people are stopped by fear. So whether someone's just getting started or trying to scale up to their next level, just share a little bit about some of the things that you've had to overcome with that. And you know, what helped you along that, that, that pathway. So, I think you get used to the fear. <laughs> I think that that's part of it. It's kind of like, you know, when an actor, I think I shared this with you, with, with this you once, um, an actor gets up, they still have that butterfly feeling in their stomach before they're going to act, but they still go ahead and do it, and you start to just be able to control that demon a little bit. I'm terrified sometimes when I go into work. I don't know why. Sometimes I, I don't have any reason to it, and I'm almost... Uh, you know, concerned to share this publicly, but there's a point where I'm like, oh my God, how am I going to do this? And I've never not been able to do it. You know, I mean, I, you know, I have challenges, things have failed, things have gone very successful, but it's kind of like just allowing that fear to be there and meditation has helped an incredible amount. And then realizing, you know, just get out of my way, you know, Sometimes I'm in the, sometimes I think I'm in my own way and to just sort of step back, look at it, look what I have, share a little gratitude and not do work and then go back into it with some fresh eyes. And it's a much, a much more pleasant place to be in approaching that. Guys, there's a lot of wisdom in what he just said. So I just want to pinpoint a few things that I heard in that. And hopefully the listeners heard more than I did. Um, But one thing is, you know, you would think hundreds of rental properties later, there's no fear, right? And it's like, no, it, there, it, there's still some fear there when you're when you're taking new moves or new actions, and maybe sometimes it's fear of 
losing, right? Or fear of things changing, but, um, continu continually taking action in the face of fear. I think that's the definition of courage. Mm -hmm. That's really what I heard in there was like, and then learning how to manage, you said, manage that demon, yeah. which is like the, the negative thought process. That's why I said scarcity and lack. Mm -hmm. Cause when you're living in abundance and wealth, you're not in that fear-based mode and you can, you can look at something and you can make a rational decision. As soon as the fear kicks in, you can't, and you've, you've learned how to manage that. And you said meditations helped stepping away from the business, coming back at it with fresh eyes, you know, like how many times are we just grinding so hard that we don't even have the right mindset to make clear, bigger, bigger, better decisions. So many people will be further along in life if they take a little time away and make a right. few great decisions per year versus just continually working harder and harder. Right. And I mean, sometimes it's not spending 12 hours in the office and being the first guy there and the last to leave. Sometimes it's going in the office for me for three or four hours and killing it those three or four hours and then getting out of the way and letting my team do their job. And that, and that, that I think sometimes is my most effective, powerful day. And that's, that's a big transition for a lot of business owners, right? Mm -hmm. When there's everything's on them, how have you, I guess this is be more for someone who ha is scaling or has scaled. How have you handled the challenges of letting go of control a little bit and trusting that you have the right team in place? Cause that's another big thing. I'm, I'm smiling because that's my fear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause as I let go and I think, Oh, who's going to do that? Are they going to do it the right way? which isn't necessarily the right way because it's my way. Is my way the right way? I don't know. It's still going to get done, and it does. And I'm like, I'm still sort of magically surprised sometimes when I go away for a week or two and I come back and there's three things on my desk that need my signature and like, you know, a 15-minute meeting with, with two or three people. And I'm like, okay, I guess, I guess everything was okay. I mean, I'm still in touch with the office. I'm not an absent guy. But, yeah, no, I know. But, you know, anything that was an emergency, I already dealt with through a quick phone call. But, you know, it, it's, it's really empowering your people that, that has done that. So how did that transition happen? I think um, through, tra through training, you know, and, and I'm sort of a hands-on kind of a trainer. So come with me, look at this property do you see what I see? Do you, you, you know, I want my properties to stand out. When you walk through Westchester, I don't want to look like this. I want to look like this. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I think that's worked and that's, and they sometimes do a better job than I do. Yeah. And some of the contractors are like, <clears throat> Oh, we don't have anything to do. I'm going to go take a walk. And then they come back with a list and I'm like, go for it, <laughs> go for it, do it. And it's not like, you know, it, it's, well, I know it's these old stuff. buildings cause yeah. I own a few, mm -hmm. uh, nothing like you do, but there, there's always something to do on old buildings. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that you've shared a lot of wisdom with this. Um, one thing, you know, that I like to ask is like, have you had any mentors? Is there any books that you recommend? Any courses, anything you recommend to the listeners out there? Um, the, we, we, we've been working with the book traction and, and, um, working with that process, but my team is not as tight with a process where, where, you know, we'll build a lot of SOPs and a lot of very strict ways of doing stuff. It's very fluid. And that's kind of the way I think, you know, I come from, I, I'm dyslexic, I'm have ADHD and, you know, I just kind of deal with life that way. So um, I think part of it has been finding really, really strong people that have been able to work with me, if that makes sense. And they understand me and, and they're, un, they're knowing that if they're going to sit down with me, I'm going to be all over the place in my conversation. And they're able to kind of keep up with it. And that was sort of, that was my dad who was my mentor. The two of us could sit together, talk about 10 different properties and in one sentence without pausing to say, you know, this room's in that one and this room's in that one and this roof's there. And we would totally understand each other. So there was this magic kind of thing. So he was, he was the biggest mentor that I had. Um, so much in life and, you know, just watching this incredible businessman uh, go from, you know, just, just from being a pharmacist to being a community member to, to what he, what he's 
done with real estate and, and how he would buy stuff. Never sat down to teach me a thing. Never said, this is what to do. He would go, I'll see you later. Here's the information. If you have a question, I'll be available. And it's like, and I was at a settlement or I was at a negotiation for buying a property or finishing so he something taught, up. he taught you the best way. Yeah, I guess so. Figure it out. <laughs> yeah, it, w- it w- kind of pissed me off but at the time. But, <laughs> but looking back, was, think there about it. There was yeah. a lot of wisdom in that. It would have been nice to have a little information. It's funny because before I met you, I've heard, I heard about your dad so many times, like you got to meet Stan, you know, from multiple different people. Uh, and I remember, I, I forget who it was, but I was trying to get connected through him. This is obviously years ago before he passed away. Mm-hmm. So I'm so grateful to get knowledge from you since I never got a chance to meet your dad, but a mm. um, little recognition for him. Cause he obviously did a great job with not just building a business, but raising a great son and a good person. Yeah. Um, well, anything else that you want to share is just like last words of wisdom, anything that you think is important. Um, I think, I think it's smart to get out there and try stuff. But I think pe- what, what I'm seeing is a big trend of like everybody being encouraged, go out and buy real estate. You can't fail. Um, I think that there, that you have to still, you have to really look at that and make sure you're going to be okay. And you're going to be able to be dedicated to that process and, and, and do it carefully and smartly. And, and, and I hope that makes sense to some people. And um, I'm out there, I'm available, you know, look me up, call me, email me. I'd like to say that too, that I'd be happy to, you know, share with your listeners further if anybody has any questions. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll, we'll post uh, a way to contact you, whatever Scott, is willing to put out there. But um, yeah, we, I just want to thank you very much for being on because I got a lot out of it. I hope the listeners did as well. And um, you know, we hope that you can take something from this and take action because all this is really not very valuable unless it really makes an impact on your life. But real estate can actually change not just one generation, but multiple generations. The Zukin family is you know, one of the families that I think will continue legacy um, real estate wealth, in my opinion. And I know Scott's, um, you know, we've talked extensively about state planning and, you know, all that kind of what's like, what's next, you know, for Mm -hmm. future generations. um, Because I think like that as well, and I believe it's possible, uh, just the impact that you can have on a community, future generations, it's such an amazing thing. And for him to be able to sit here and share his experience. We're very grateful. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Scott. All right. Bye.